you look up at the statue, the monument with the bugle pointing upward toward the falling wall. The second figure is a truckman. He's holding his ax up to protect himself. And the third figure is an engine man directing his hose stream onto the fire, unaware of the falling wall. The monument was conceived by a group of retired firefighters. It's the result of eight years of fundraising and lobbying. But only in recent weeks was it clear that their dream would become reality. Early on, they told the story of the tragedy to sculptor Tom Scarf, who designed the piece. I started doing their portraits, and one portrait came after the next. Then I put my hands into the clay, and all of a sudden it was, you know, I liken it unto a composer writing a song. Uh, it just is one of those songs that within two hours was a finished piece. The families of the victims of the 1910 Stockyards fire built their own individual monuments long ago. Now there's one for all to contemplate. What do you want people to take away from this monument when they see it? That a fireman's job is a very tough job. When they go out, they don't know if they're coming back, no matter what it is. A lot of times they're sitting in the firehouse and people are saying, oh yeah, they're not doing anything. Yes, they are. They're doing. They're worrying about what their next job is going to be. The Nelson Morris packing plant at 44th and Loomis shortly after dawn, December 22, 1910. Red hot bricks and smoldering timber from the remains of building number seven covered overturned boxcars and twisted rail. A fire raged nearby and threatened to spread. But buried beneath the debris were Chicago firefighters, including the chief and the number three in command. All told, 21 Chicago firefighters lost their lives there in 1910, just three days before Christmas. The first alarm sounded at the Englewood Fire Alarm Office at 4.08 in the morning. Telegraphs chattered in firehouses across the city as the call was transmitted, and the companies in the vicinity rushed to the scene. This is what 44th and Loomis looks like today. With the exception of the railroad tracks, there is nothing in common with the scene here in 1910. Back then, the rail traffic was non-stop, bringing in the livestock, shipping out the meat and byproducts. The Nelson Morris complex covered an entire city block. Nelson Morris, a successful German immigrant, was in the same league as the Swifts and the Armors. But from the perspective of a firefighter, any call to Packingtown, as the stockyards were commonly called, had dangerous potential. You had hay, you had everything was made of uh, 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 lumber. You had uh, many brick buildings in there, large buildings, but l they were laden with grease. It was a seven-story building similar to this where the fire broke out in the basement and spread. No photos survive of the earliest efforts to put out the blaze, but there was an immediate problem. Lack of water. The water supply into the stockyards was minimal. It was uh, a low-pressure system. Fighting that fire was like sending soldiers to war without bullets. The pumpers in some cases had to draw water from hydrants 1,200 feet from the blaze. When Chief James Horan arrived on the scene at 5 in the morning, his men were losing the battle. So he said, the heck with it. He says, let's get in and get this fire out. And none of them hesitated. They just, that's what we got to do. That's what you pay for. And you don't even think about it because they figure the faster we put the fire out, the faster we can go home. The vanguard positioned themselves on a covered platform used as a loading dock. Building number 7, the source of the fire, was just to the south. The men were in a dangerous position between the railroad tracks and the building when suddenly... The building exploded and a wall collapsed, trapping 21 firefighters beneath tons of rubble. There was a fire telegraph installed in Chief Horan's home on South Ashland. 
The chief's wife, Margaret, listened for hours as the extra alarm sounded, not knowing that she'd become a widow. Reporters loved Chief Horan, and the chief was apparently flattered by their periodic attention. His favorite pose was at his roll-top desk, where he sat for the Daily News in 1906. A year later, the Tribune persuaded him to rise from his chair and demonstrate how quickly he could slip into his boots when the alarm rang and how quickly he could don his coat and hat. Horan joined the department as a water boy in 1881. A quarter century later, he was number one. He had a very rapid rise in the department. Uh, he kept getting promoted uh, almost yearly, and uh, he made a number of daring rescues uh, during his career. He uh, rescued firemen, uh, one who had fallen in the Chicago River. He uh, rescued another fireman from a, a, a blazing building that no one else would enter. In late January of 1900, when an office building at 98 West Washington went up in flames, Jim Horan was the base of a human ladder that enabled a woman to climb to safety. Rose Ingledew joined the list of those who owed their lives to a firefighter who was also an innovator. He uh, created a number of new fire companies, built new firehouses, and uh, did everything to modernized the department. He was a, a go-to-it guy. He, in fact, went just before uh, the fire in the stockyards, he went before the city council and demanded better water pressure in the stockyards. As the papers later pointed out, Chief Horan made his last plea for a high-pressure water system in the yards less than 24 hours before the stockyards fire broke out. The men of Engine 39 on 33rd place were among the first responders. Captain Dennis Doyle was their leader. He and his wife lived half a block away. His son Nick was also a firefighter. It's said that at one time there were enough Doyles in the department to man an entire company. Truck 39 looks the same today as it did in 1910. It's what rolls out of the building that's changed. Though Marshall Fields at Christmas time in 1910 boasted it had two dozen trucks at the ready for deliveries, Chief Horan's 1906 Buick was the only motorized vehicle the fire department had at its disposal. The rest of the department's horsepower came from horses, and it took quite a bit of work to get them rolling. They had to let the horses out of the stables in the back, hook them up to the, the engine, had to start the engine fire in the firebox, had to get the, the hose wagon out in front of the engine to even to pull out of the firehouse. So all of that work had to be done before they even started to respond to the fire. And compared to the firefighters of today, the men of Engine 39 and all Chicago firefighters were ill-equipped. We wore cloth gloves, leather, like a raincoat, and rubber boots, and a leather helmet. That was all the equipment we had. For these men, the hours were long and the work was dangerous, but relatively speaking, it was a desirable job. People were working uh, in the stockyards for uh, 16 hours, lugging meat and stuff. So being a fireman, even though you're 24 hours, was sort of a nice job, you know. Uh, and you, you usually were stationed near your home so the children come visit you and your wife can come visit you. In fact, it was in a rule book where you could have a visitation of your wife and the captain would have to uh, have the use of his room if you wanted to. It was in a rule book, one of the old rule books. Recovering the remains of the 21 trapped firefighters was a nightmare. The rubble was still burning. They did their rescue work. Their hands were bleeding, and they were uh, on top of a hot brick pile. And uh, there was always uh, uh, the possibility of uh, the other floors collapsing onto them. And hand by hand, they removed the rubble from the top of these heroic firefighters and brought them out one by one. The helmet of Deputy Chief James Burroughs is one of the first things they found. Then they found Burroughs himself. They found Captain Pat Collins, Lieutenant Ed Dennis, pipeman Tom Costello, truckman Al Moriarty, they found Captain Dennis Doyle of Engine 39 and Nick, his son, of Hook and Ladder 11. In many cases, it wasn't immediately clear to the rescuers whom they had found. I don't want to be too graphic, but uh, in the stories that we see that they, they actually found pieces of the firemen. One firefighter's hands were still on an ax, but the, but the torso was not with it. Um, another one was the Chief Horan. He was sitting in a, 
a, a sitting position. And his face was unblemished, you know, from uh, the turmoil of the bricks falling on him. And he had his arms folded, and uh, it appeared to some that he was sitting there facing an enemy, uh, which was the fire itself. Mayor Fred Bussey was on the scene, and what he saw hit him hard. He had not only made Jim Horan head of the department, he'd been his close friend since childhood. Christmas in Chicago turned into a time of mourning as preparations were made to bury those who'd just been dug from the rubble. Three were buried on Christmas Eve, eight on Christmas Day, 12 on December 26th, and one on December 27th. 18 women were left widows, and 40 children were left fatherless. Cook and Ladder 11 at 34th and Calumet fared worst of all at the fire. Of the seven men who responded to the call, not one survived to return to quarters. When the truck had left that morning, one of the firefighters' wives, she looked out of her window and she knew how they were responding to a fire, and uh, she was worried. Well, she stayed at that window uh, for many, many hours until the truck returned, but it had all different firemen on it and none of the firemen would look at her, and that's when she knew her husband was dead. Captain Dennis Doyle of Engine 39 and his son Nick of Hook and Ladder 11 were buried together in Mount Olivet Cemetery. Truckman Al Moriarty of Hook and Ladder 11 was buried a few feet away. The victims of the 1910 Sockyards fire were buried in half a dozen Chicago cemeteries. Lieutenant Henry Brandenburg of Hook and Ladder 11 had traded days off with a colleague so he could celebrate Christmas with his family. Lieutenant James Fitzgerald of Engine 23 was scheduled to be married on Christmas Eve. Truckman Edward Schoenset of Hook and Ladder 11 died on his 27th birthday. On Christmas Eve, he would have celebrated his third wedding anniversary. In one of the pockets of William Weber, the driver of Engine 59, they found three letters to Santa Claus. Weber was planning to Christmas shop for his kids at the end of his shift. Chief Horan was but one of 21 who never learned how their families planned to surprise them on Christmas Day. His wife's Christmas gift to him that year was uh, photographs of their two young children, which he never got a chance to see the photographs since he uh, died in the fire. Chicagoans, however, saw the pictures when the papers published them. In the time-honored tradition of Chicago journalism, reporters sought out not only photos of the victims, but of those who had survived them, especially those of tender age. They draped the roll-top desk of Chief Horan in black crepe, but only after they'd made a discovery. They found that hundreds of children had written letters to him asking the fire department to uh, create skating rinks in their backyards and uh, the uh, fire marshal had signed okay to all the uh, requests, and he had written a memo uh, urging uh, the uh, rinks to be poured uh, before Christmas so the children could enjoy skating on their Christmas break. Mayor Bussey wrote letters of condolence to the widows. Editorial writers looked for someone or something to blame. A blue ribbon coroner's jury called for a high pressure water system in the yards. And in time, most of Chicago forgot about those who died on December 22nd, 1910, just three days before Christmas.
The special coroner's jury looking into that fire also recommended that all industrial buildings greater than four stories be equipped with automatic sprinkler systems.